I'm Jerry Woodworth. I'm a nurse at St. Luke's Maternal Fetal Medicine um, here in Boise. Um, I am also a Psych NP student at Gonzaga University. And they are playing in the Sweet 16. I got my, my Zags t-shirt on today. So um, sending them good, good wishes. Um, so just a little bit about my background. I am primarily an OB nurse. I work with Dr. Saib here um, at Maternal Fetal Medicine. We run what we call our support clinic, um, and that's our perinatal substance use program. We started that about five years ago, and we are always upfront with everyone and say we are OB people. We, you know, he's an obstetrician. I'm an OB nurse, but we have the special interest and special um, kind of place in our heart for for um, moms who are struggling with mental health issues and. Um, um, addiction, um, substance use issues. So we started this program. Um, I generally give this talk to people who are focused in pregnancy and it's more educating them about the substance use stuff. So this time I'm going to try to, you know, turn it a little bit so um, we can, um, you know, help you, those of you who are more focused on the addiction medicine side of it to help you understand the pregnancy stuff. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so when it comes to substance use and pregnancy, you know, it, pregnancy in general is kind of like a hot potato. Nobody wants to take care of a pregnant woman unless they're an obstetrician. You know, I always think back to the days when I was an L&D nurse and I was working in triage and we got this call from the ED that said, um, we've got a mom in here who's 18 weeks pregnant and she has a compound fracture in her arm. We're bringing her up to labor and delivery. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hold up. You know, I don't want someone with a broken arm here. This isn't an, an an emergency problem and she's pregnant. If she's not bleeding and she's not in labor, let's treat that problem um, with the specialists that know those things. And we can pull in the specialists that help with her other issues. So, you know, I always try to think about um, when we're caring for moms um, with other issues in pregnancy, it's like kind of like driving down the highway. Like if everybody stays in their own lane, we're going to all arrive at the same place in a safe, orderly manner that keeps everyone um, doing well. So substance use and pregnancy, it kind of encompasses a lot of different um, specialties. So there's definitely the obstetric side. Uh, we worry about the pediatric side, like what happens after this kiddo is born, the addiction medicine part of it, behavioral health. You know, we all kind of own a piece of this. And so if we all work together, we can treat this mom and her family and hopefully help her through her pregnancy to achieve the goals that she wants to achieve. Okay, next slide. Um, so our learning objectives today, just, you know, like I said, I give this talk a lot to people who do with pre deal with pregnancy. So you guys, a lot of this will be just, we'll just kind of skip, skip through it, but definitely want to use person-centered language um, when talking about patients and talking with patients with substance use disorder. Um, just familiar with the basic concepts of addiction, which I'm sure you guys are all well aware of. Uh, become familiar with screening for substance use disorder and perinatal mood and anxiety disorders in pregnancy. And I kind of lump those together because, um, I mean, they're definitely very separate issues, but oftentimes we see a lot of that here in our clinic, um, just kind of all kinds of mental health issues um, surrounded um, that, that coincide with pregnancy. And then just to gain an understanding of how to care for the pregnant woman with substance use disorder. Okay. So we're going to start off with language matters. Um, you know, we definitely want to use this person first centered language. We don't want to say things like, you know, substance abuse or junkie or I'm sorry that, that it's like this, Katie. I thought that I had them all just whatever, but um, just keep going until the slides full. Um, clean, clean, dirty or clean urine, born addicted, drug baby. We, don't, we try not to say those things because those can be very stigmatizing to people. Um, so we try to say things like substance use disorder, person with addiction. You know, my patients will continue to say clean no matter what, but I like to say sober in recovery. Clean and dirty urine. We talk about positive versus negative or expected versus unexpected. Um, and like those of you know, you know, addiction babies can't be born addicted. They don't have that physiological or that psychological desire to use despite negative consequences. They're born physiologically dependent. So they're not born addicted. And then babies aren't drug babies. They're, you know, opioid, opiate exposed, um, exposed as opposed to, you know, drug baby. We don't like to say that. Next slide, please. Um, so what is addiction? We talk about um, addiction being, oh, there's, supposed to be a little, oh, there we go. Um, you know, here's kind of all those addiction, all those people that have a say in, you know, how we define addiction. And, and really none of these things talk about being a moral failure. It's a chronic medical disease. It's a brain disease. It's a, 
um, you know, a so social, physical, psychological problem, but nowhere is it a moral failure. And I think especially when we start talking about moms and pregnant women, pregnant people who use substances, um, it very quickly switches, you know, to th thinking about it being a moral failure. Um, we hear, you know, people, people will shame and stigmatize um, people who use substances. And when you add pregnancy to it, it just compounds it. In fact, you know, people who use oftentimes will look down on people who use while they're pregnant, just because it's, it has carries so much more impact. Next slide, please. So why do people use substances? Um, you know, recreation, trauma, ACEs, ch adverse childhood experiences, escape, prescriptions gone wrong. We kind of see that a lot um, with our population, you know, women who've been prescribed um, opioids for endo endometriosis or other surgeries and, and things have gotten out of control based on, you know, other situations in their life, um, social pressure, mental illness, all that kind of stuff. If you haven't read the book In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, I really recommend that. Um, for anyone who treats um, people with substance use disorder, for the most part, it's a really great book. There's a couple of things in it where I'm like, eh, I don't know if I agree with his conclusions, but it's one of those that just really kind of gets to me. But um, Gabor Mate, who is the author of the book, he says, um, the question is never why the addiction, but why the pain? You know, and that could be physical pain, that can be emotional pain, that can be, you know, all kinds of pain um, that generally leads to addiction issues. Next slide. So here's another one, you people who are well-versed in opioid use disorder, <laughs> probably seen it, or at least you understand the concept. Um, I really, really like this slide because it works well for um, a lot of people who don't work with addiction. Um, they don't understand, you know, even healthcare workers who don't understand why people can't just quit using opioids. This is a great slide to show um, family members and patients when they also understand, you know, don't know why they can't just stop using. Um, so, you know, we think about a patient uses, they feel good, come back down to normal. They use, they feel good, comes back to normal. And eventually, you know, that same amount that they're using is going to make them feel less euphoria, feel less high. And then they finally get to the point where they're using just to stave off the withdrawal, just to keep from getting dope sick. So, so that's a really interesting concept for people to think that, that people aren't always using to get high. A lot of times they're using just so they don't feel bad. So that's when we talk about initiating, um, you know, opioid replacement um, to help people keep their, keep their steadiness so that they can work on their other addiction issues. Uh, that's another thing I've, I, I wish I could remember where I read it, but when we talk about, we'll talk about it in a little bit, the buprenorphine and, um, methadone, but when we talk about using medications for opioid use disorder, I like to think of it as a life jacket. So the medication is the life jacket that keeps you afloat while you're working on the swimming lessons, which are the other coping behavior things in your life to help you be able to, to, to live, right? So life jacket and swimming lessons, I think that's a good way to think of it. Uh, next slide. And then we here in maternal fetal medicine um, definitely work on the harm reduction approach, you know, um, meeting the patient where the patient's at, you know, patients will come to us and say, you know, you've got to help me get off of, of this, or, you know, I need to work on my, um, uh, my meth, my meth use disorder, whatever, but I'm going to continue to smoke marijuana. That's just where it's at. I, I draw the line and we say, fine, let's work on what we can work on. Um, another one is tobacco cigarettes. We know for sure that moms who use tobacco, um, that compounds a lot of the other things that they use. And if they could quit that, that would be great, but, but they can't always. So we say each cigarette less that you smoke is one cigarette less that the pregnancy is exposed to. So if you come to me telling me you're smoking 15 cigarettes a day, how about at your next visit, you tell me, um, let's make a goal to smoke 12 a day or, you know, 10 a day. So just, just trying to cut back and meeting people where they're at. If you set out these expectations of, you know, you're going to be, um, completely sober by this date, that doesn't always work. So meeting the patient where the patient's at is a great, great harm reduction technique that we, um, that we live by here. Next slide. And again, like I said, I, I show this one to everyone. I'm sure you all know you can buy um, naloxone, Narcan over the counter, um, used to reverse an opioid overdose. This is just, that's my, always my public health, uh, plea to everyone to make sure that that's in your in your home medicine cabinet. 
Okay, next slide. All right, so here we go into the, the pregnancy part of it. So pregnancy is a really unique time of um, motivation for sobriety. It's not the end all be all, you know, a, a woman cannot become sober for her baby. She can only become sober for herself. And a lot of times that is so she can be a better, a better mother, a better, you know, a better person in her, in her mind that um, she is engaged in the healthcare system, at least in the state of Idaho, she's almost guaranteed to have some kind of um, funding, some kind of insurance. So it's a great time to really capture this population who oftentimes slip through the cracks. So we really try to get people and bring them in. Um, when we treat a pregnant woman for a substance use disorder or a mental health issue that really can have cascading impacts on a family, you know, briefly, previously we talked about ACEs. I'm going to hope that you all um, are familiar with the concept of adverse childhood experiences. But if we can catch a mom and help her get sober and help her deal with her mental health issues, then sometimes we can stop that that cycle um, or at least, you know, bring it down a little bit. Um, so treating a pregnant woman, cascading impacts. Um, about 21% of pregnant women will have some sort of perinatal mood or an anxiety disorder. And, you know, that can be any time during pregnancy in the um, antepartum period and the postpartum period. Um, so we know those patients are out there. About 5% of pregnant women use substances. Um, and so, you know, when we go to talk with a lot of other OB patients or a lot of other OB providers, they'll say, well, you know, these people, you know, I don't have any of those people in my practice. And I'm like, I, you know, you do, <laughs> you really do. Um, so we definitely encourage people to screen for it. Um, we screen for gestational diabetes in every pregnancy. And that incidence rate of that is like two to 10%. We screen for preeclampsia pretty much with every OB visit and that's like two to 5%. So really when you're talking about it and thinking about it, um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are off the charts compared to those other things that we screen for regularly. And, and very often we don't screen for those in the OB setting. Um, and substance use, you know, people are afraid, oftentimes are afraid to alienate their patients by asking about substance use, but these women and these families are already in your practice. And so we need to try to use this time to, to capture them and to do what we can to help them. Um, there's definitely risks to treating pregnancy and risks to not treating a pregnancy. Like I said, you know, pregnancy seems to be a pretty big hot potato. Anybody who's pregnant, um, oftentimes, you know, they're pregnant, they're on pain medication. I'm not gonna prescribe for them anymore, I'm sorry. Or, um, you know, they're, they are getting treatment for mental health disorder. I, I can't, the, the risk is too high. The liability is too high. And I want to turn it around and say, you know, the liability of not treating is high. You know, if you have a patient that you think needs to be on these medications prior to pregnancy and the little line on the stick turns positive, that doesn't mean that those problems went away. So there's definitely risks to not treating a pregnancy. We know with studies, show that sometimes that um, outcomes are actually very similar for newborns whose moms are um, who are experiencing untreated mental illness versus moms who are experiencing um, mental illness with treatment with medication and so if the, the outcomes are the same for newborns why don't we make moms healthier too because that's going to make life better for everybody um, and then it can be very rewarding it can be a very difficult um, very difficult place to be sometimes, but it, it's a very rewarding, a rewarding thing. How we can do that is um, we advocate for our patients. Um, being an advocate is is pretty much what I do <laughs> all the time. It's not that Dr. Saib here and I are doing, you know, groundbreaking work or anything. We are just here for our patients. We're here to help them um, hook in with the responsibility or with the um, resources that are available to them. Um, the resources that they deserve to have, um, and, and we advocate for them for sure. We do a lot of education, talking with the patient, talking with their partner, talking with um, I do, a, like I said, a lot of education with other healthcare providers who just don't really know that, that treating people um, for substance use disorder in pregnancy is, is a thing and how, how we can do it. And so we spend a lot of time um, uh, educating 
you know, our colleagues. We work in collaboration with other providers for sure. So um, we have patients that will come to us and they are already very stable on, you know, methadone. Um, they go to their OB and their OB says, okay, well, as soon as we can wean you off this, things will be great. And the patient says, oh my God. And they rightfully so should say that. So, um, you know, we work to try to help those other OBs understand that methadone in pregnancy is absolutely, a, um, can be a necessary thing for a lot of people. And so how do we work with, with them? How do we work with, say, Raise the Bottom or Center for Behavioral Health to help them, um, you know, with their methadone dosing or, you know, if patients are having issues, you know, how do, how do we do that kind of thing? So definitely work in collaboration. Demonstrate empathy. I have to say, hands down, number one thing that breaks my heart that I hear at almost every new um, intake patient visit, new patient intake visit, is thank you for being so nice, which I think, I mean, what, what are you talking about? What, who's not being nice to you? And they say, you know, I went into my other doctor's office and, um, and I got, you know, you should stop. You, what, look at what you're doing to your baby. These are horrible things. Um, you know, we have a lot of providers in the area that prescribe to the to not to um, concept of, of medicine, of, especially when it comes to addiction medicine, you know, just telling them to not to, you know, I'm using fentanyl. Oh, you should not do that. I'm going to tell you to not to do that, you know, and, and that doesn't work. So these patients feel very stigmatized, very shamed, and just saying, hey, you're in a safe place. We're here to help you. What can we do for you? Um, you know, that's a, that role can't be underestimated. And then just lots and lots and lots of patients. We, um, you know, being pregnant is difficult just in general. Having a substance use disorder is very difficult in general. And having the two of them together, especially when a lot of these patients don't have a lot of great resources, they don't have a lot of great support. So just having patients to help, um, help them get through what they need, getting to what they need, um, that's, that's a pretty big one for us. Okay, next slide. So screening, um, just briefly, mental health screening, if um, you're going to do it, if you're seeing pregnant women, um, we use a tool that's, we want to use a tool that's validate, validated for pregnancy. We here um, at St. Luke's use the ED, EPDS, the Edinburgh uh, Perinatal Depression Screening. Um, you can use these other ones if that's what you're, um, you're used to in your program. Um, we just want to make sure that it is validated for pregnancy because pregnancy can be a little bit different. So ACOG is the American College of OBGYNs and their guidelines to say to screen for mental health once in a um, perinatal period and then if screened during pregnancy screen at the comprehensive postpartum visit. Um, I have to say here in our, our program, we screen people initially at their first visit and then obviously we're always checking in. We haven't filled out the screener at the first visit, but every visit when they check in, we, you know, how you doing, even, even moms who are um, not substance use moms. We talk to them a lot. And then at every postpartum visit, it is reimbursable. You can bill for, for screening for um, perinatal um, mood and anxiety disorders. Substance use disorder, that's another one. You want to use a validated tool for pregnancies. Here, um, we use the four Ps here in our office because it's a pretty easy one. It's just a yes or no. You know, did, did your parents use? Did your partner use? Um, I can't think of the other the other P's, but um, it's just yes or no, and it's pretty easy to to just look at. Um, ACOG again says early universal screening for pregnant women, um, also reimbursable. And I just want a, a big big push here, and I'm sure all you addiction medicine um, specialists understand that. But drug urine drug testing is not screening for substance use disorder. Um, here at St. Luke's, anyway, we do not do. Um, urine drug screening on all, all patients that come in. Um, there are some things that trigger a, a urine drug screen that would be like, you know, late to care, delivering at home, um, a precipitous delivery, which can be caused from, um, from using substances. Um, but here in our office specifically, I can't speak to the other places in the hospital because the language in our policy is a little bit loose but here at our office we do not send urine drug screening without patient consent and that includes patients that come in for you know who, who tell us they've been using um now that being said they don't may not get a prescription if they're not um if they're not willing to give us a urine drug screen or at least talk about it um 
but we don't just send them without t- telling patients because the the implications for a pregnant woman with a positive urine drug screen can be really, really um, damaging or, or they can just have bigger impacts than for someone who's not pregnant. Um, so we, we do it only with consent. Uh, next slide. So, um, you know, we try to do um, some of the, the screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment um, things here. This is where I, I spend a lot of time talking with other providers who are saying, you know, I don't want to ask patients about substance use. I don't want to alienate them. I don't want them to think that I'm um, stereotyping them and asking them. And, and so I just encourage people to practice it so it comes natural, it comes out of their mouth. It doesn't seem like it's, oh my gosh, you have a tattoo, you know, you must be using drugs kind of thing. Um, so we fill out the screener. And like I said, our screener is just a yes or a no. And so then there's four questions. And I just say to patients, um, these are generally patients who come to us for other reasons other than our substance use clinic. Um, I'll say, you know, anytime that we see a patient that answers yes to any of these questions, we know that that puts them at a higher risk for substance use. Um, is that anything that you've dealt with in the past or anything, you know, you want to talk about with this? And I just try to make it, you know, pretty, pretty nonchalant. Um, the brief intervention part, you know, we do what we can to say, okay, so you're telling me that you smoke marijuana. Um, and we talk a little bit about that, you know, we do the old, um, you know, how, on a scale of zero to 10, how much do you want to quit? Zero being none, 10 being the most. And they give you a number and you say, well, why isn't it lower to help them build up their um, reasons for, for wanting to quit? Talk about a plan. And then we get to referral for treatment. And at that point here in Idaho, and I'm finding maybe everywhere, um, we get a little bit stuck because like I said, all of you are out there doing excellent work. Many of you are full. <laughs> Many of you are not taking patients um, on, a, on a pretty quick turnaround like we need to with a pregnant woman. Um, so here in Boise and Nampa a little bit, we, we actually see, you know, same, we will see patients in our program from anywhere if they can get to us um, for the treatment during their pregnancy. As far as I know, there's not a lot of great inpatient places for pregnant women. Um, the Walker Center will take a pregnant woman. Um, they don't, there's some funding issues there. There's, um, I believe there's a place in Ontario. Um, but as far as inpatient treatment for substance use disorder for pregnant women, the options are fairly limited, um, at least here in Southern Idaho. Um, as far as, you know, Intensive outpatient programs, there, there are some, it's sometimes difficult to get patients in. Um, so that's where, you know, we, we want to expand everyone's knowledge in caring for pregnant women because the more people that are available to care for pregnant women, the more options we have. Next slide. So considerations in pregnancy, you know, nobody wakes up one day and decides to be an IV drug user, especially if they're pregnant. So these substance use um, issues were likely prior to pregnancy and they, they were likely ongoing for a while. Um, people with substance use disorder have decreased access to family planning things, so, or family planning um, opportunities. So oftentimes these are unplanned pregnancies. Um, so it's, that's another added stress on top of of the situation. And then women in general just have unique issues related to substance use disorder. You know, they have a history of more traumatic life events, um, different changes in the brain. Um, you know, they sex hormones can make people more sensitive. So just women in general have different issues. Next slide. Um, so if you're caring for a woman um, with a substance use disorder who is pregnant, um, we always want to add a hepatitis C to their um, prenatal panel. Um, here in the St. Luke system, that has just been added in. That's a kind of a new recommendation from ACOG to screen everyone for hepatitis C. So um, that's become standard on our panel. Um, so anyone who is high risk, I like to add the, the reflex to a viral load because sometimes it's hard to track down the lab. Once the, once the blood has been sent, sometimes it's hard to find it to add the viral load if the hep C antibody comes back positive. Um, and then we also want to add the CMP or complete metabolic panel just to check on their liver function if it does come back positive. Um, if a patient is at high risk for um, um, 
getting a sexually transmitted infection like chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, something like that, we'll want, uh, HIV, we'll want to repeat those infectious labs in the third trimester as we get closer to delivery. We will add extra ultrasounds on. We want to monitor growth in the third trimester. So that can be in the form of ultrasounds. It can be in the form of um, measuring fundal heights to see if how babies are growing. We worry about um, some growth restriction a little bit with um, people who are using substances. Postpartum birth control, a very important issue. We want to make sure, like I said, a lot of these people end up with pregnancies that are unexpected and un, um, unplanned. And so if we can help a woman space her pregnancies out and have a pregnancy when she desires a pregnancy, that's going to help with a lot of issues. So we, we really try to um, encourage all of our patients, but especially our patients with substance use disorder to use some kind of long acting reversible contraception. So something like an IUD or um, a Nexplanon, which is a little implant that goes in the arm, um, something that you don't have to think about, that it's just there. And then when you're ready to have a baby, you have it um, removed. We do a lot of education with our patients. So NOWS, which is Neonatal Opioid Withdrawal Syndrome. It's also known as NAS, Neonatal Abstinence Syndrome. Um, you know, this is a, um, what we might expect that a baby would experience after delivery. So this is um, for someone who's using opioids. I like to explain it to my patients that it's similar to, you know, when they are, when they stop using or when they're withdrawing, but it's <clears throat> slightly different. Um, so when a mom is, has been using or has been getting medication for a pregnant or for opioid use disorder um, and <clears throat> the baby's born, the umbilical cord's cut, the baby's no longer getting the opioid. And so depending on how short acting or long acting the, um, the opioid was, baby will potentially start to have um, withdrawal symptoms. So that's something that the we expect. We expect it might happen as a side effect of the disease that the, that the patient has. I try to, I use a lot, an analogy a lot of diabetes or type two diabetes because there's, um, with addiction, there's a little bit of a, you know, there's definitely the, the physical component and there's a lot of the, you know, self-determination, the, um, you know, choices that people make component, component to it also. So um, I, I say things like, we expect, this is a, expect, a side effect that we might expect from the treatment that we're giving you for a disease that you have. It's something we can manage. We know it's coming. We'll tell all the providers about it and we can help your baby get through it. Um, so we do a lot of education on that. Pain management, especially during labor. Um, we talk to patients about that. A lot of them are worried, you know, can I have pain medication in labor? And absolutely you can. Um, if a patient is on buprenorphine or methadone, you'll want to continue that during their labor. You don't want to use that. You don't want to stop it. And you don't want to use it as pain medication, pain control for labor. Um, so you just, you know, that keeps them on that, that wave we were talking about. That keeps them at the steady state. But if they start to have pain, we need to treat that. Um, so anyone who is on um, buprenorphine, we want to be a little bit cautious about what we give them during labor. Um, we don't want to give them butorphanol or statol or nalbufen, um, nubane. We don't want to give them anything like that because that can kick them into um, precipitated withdrawal. So a great option if you have it at your hospital um, would be something like a Remy fentanyl uh, PCA set up by anesthesia, something that's short acting. Um, a full antagonist that can just um, help help with the pain. Um, regional anesthesia is great. Epidurals are wonderful. Um, but if a patient has to have a C-section, they can still have pain medication afterwards. We, we do a lot of education um, with nurses specifically about patients who might have hyperalgesia. So these patients are not drug seeking just because they are have a substance use disorder. Um, and they're telling you it hurts and they need more pain medication, it's probably because their mu receptors are all kinds of messed up from, um, from the medication they've been exposed to. And they're going to need a little bit more pain medication, a little bit higher dose to get the same pain relief. So, um, you know, they're not going to need it any longer. So say we send a patient home from a C-section with five milligram um, Norco tablets, we might send someone home with 10 milligram Norco tablets. If we're going to give them three days worth for, um, for a C-section, we'll continue to give them three days worth. We're not going to give them any more, any longer, but they just may need a higher dose. Um, 
a patient using substances while they're pregnant cannot be reported to health and welfare for um, child endangerment. Once they come in to deliver, if there is um, unexpected or illicit substances in their urine or in the infant's urine or um, meconium or even in a segment of the umbilical cord, um, that triggers that mandated um, reporting by our social work team. So they will, will report to that. That being said, someone who is on a medication for opioid use disorder, so methadone or buprenorphine, again, they're taking a medication for a disease that they have that has been prescribed to them by their physician. And if that is all that's going on and there's no other issues, then that does not trigger a um, CPS or CFS um, referral because you're doing, you're doing the program you're supposed to be doing, you're taking the medications you're supposed to be taking, and that does not cause a problem. Um, we talk a lot about parenting issues. Um, we encourage breastfeeding for moms who are um, using, uh, who are taking medication for opioid uh, use disorder and not using any other illicit substances. We definitely um, recommend breastfeeding baby. There's not a ton that gets through to the breast milk, but a very small amount. Um, and that may help, but also just the holding the baby close, keeping them um, skin to skin with mom. Those are great things to do to help relieve any of those um, withdrawal symptoms. Next slide. So for medication for opioid use disorder, the main goal is relapse prevention. Um, you know, patients will often come to us either if they're using, they'll say, I just want to do a quick detox and be done with it. Um, so my baby doesn't go through withdrawal and you say, great, that's a good place to start. But our biggest concern we have is relapse prevention because we know that 60 to 90% of people who just stop using opioids are going to relapse. Um, and so we don't want um, to see that because that can, you know, all of those issues that go with using illicit substances are, are troublesome to pregnancy. So um, relapse prevention is the main goal. So, if, uh, um, you know, methadone is great. Methadone is the gold standard. Methadone is what ACOG, um, you know, recommends for um, pregnancy, um, for substance use in pregnancy. Uh, that being said, we all know here in the state of Idaho, that's not really an option for a good geographic portion of our state. Um, we really appreciate our, our colleagues at the methadone clinic for helping us out um, with our patients for sure. But, um, you know, so with methadone, if a patient is on methadone, they may see increased dose requirements due to just the increased metabolism of pregnancy. So they may, you know, start at 30 milligrams and have to titrate up during their pregnancy. Patients don't like to do that. They hate to increase it, but we just explain that you're chewing through it faster and, you um, and really, it's it's causing the same effects. It's just that your your body's metabolism, but metabolizing it. Methadone is generally given once a day. We may need to split the dose um, just to help with with metabolism and things like that. Um, the uh, severity of NAS is, or the incidence of NAS is not dose or NAS is not dose related. So, you know, theoretically, a mom who's on forty milligrams of methadone versus someone who is on eighty milligrams of methadone or buprenorphine, they're kind of, they're the same. Um, we can't predict which babies are gonna have withdrawal and which ones aren't. So we tell patients, treat your symptoms. You know, we don't want to expose the pregnancy to methadone and you feeling like crap because you're in withdrawal. So let's treat, you know, pick one lane and stay in it. So we're gonna treat it. So let's treat it till you feel better. Um, methadone, the studies show that there is an increased retention in treatment, that, that daily check-in really keeps patients a little more um, engaged. Uh, patients who are on buprenorphine are a little bit more likely to um, to stop taking their medication during pregnancy just because we give them, you know, a week, two weeks worth, um, so we don't see them as often. So buprenorphine, kind of similar similar things, increased dosing requirements. We may need to split dose, even though generally it's given once a day. Um, so the original work with buprenorphine um, in the mother study was done with the just monoproduct of buprenorphine, just um, Subutex, you know, just the buprenorphine. Um, in the last 10 years since that study came out, um, in fact, Dr. Miller, one of our uh, maternal fetal medicine doctors, worked on the, um, the subsequent study, which was a systematic review and meta analysis comparing buprenorphine monoproduct with the combo products, so Suboxone with the um, naloxone in, or the naltrexone, naltrexone, yeah, in it. Um, 
and, and the outcomes are similar. So, you know, we started off just with the one to make sure that what we were looking at, there was no issues with babies. So then we added the combo product. Um, and so that's absolutely fine to use in pregnancy if you're treating pregnant women. Um, neither one of them are approved for use in pregnancy. So you might as well use the one that, that um, is the standard for non-pregnant pregnant people to uh, prevent um, diversion and things like that. When we first started our program, we would have patients that would come to us on um, the combo product and they would want to switch to the mono product because, you know, their providers would want to switch them to the mono product because that's what the, um, you know, what the data said and what the literature said. Um, at this point, we, 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 we prescribed the, mono, the combo product just because it seems to be, um, you know, it's easier to get. There's less chance of diversion. Um, we like it better. Um, as far as, I've got my notes here because this is not stuff we deal with very often. Um, so as far as something like Vivitrol, you know, it's not recommended yet in pregnancy. Um, there are some early studies that are showing promise. Um, we are not there yet to where we can start treating patients with it. Um, you know, it does take that long period of abstinence um, prior to, to starting that may cause some issues with patients. Um, but... But at this point, it's not recommended yet. Things are looking good. Sublocade, really not, um, not any trials with that. We just have a few case reports. Um, it looks like there are teratogenic effects in animal studies. So really, we haven't moved forward with um, sublocade in pregnancy yet. OK, next slide. Barriers to treatment. This is probably what you see with a lot of um, substance use patients in general. Um, I would say that you know, the fear of legal repercussions from the parenting side is huge. Um, we definitely see that a lot, um, that patients don't want to um, disclose their substance use because they don't want to have their baby taken away. They'll end up delivering at home because they don't want their substance use to be found at the time of delivery. Um, the other um, issue would be the fear of um, judgment, you know, stigma and shame for sure, things that we're seeing. Um, like I said, when patients come to me and they're like, thank you for being nice. <laughs> what? Okay. Um, and then lack of providers, like I said, a lot of people are nervous to treat pregnant women. Um, and so, you know, that's an issue for sure. And next slide. So basically be nice, use thoughtful words. Um, addiction is not a moral failing. We want to screen all of our patients and then don't be afraid to treat people during pregnancy and, and lean on your resources. You know, if you're a a patient out um, in the community prescribing buprenorphine and you have a patient who becomes pregnant, um, you know, send them to an OB who has the training with, um, for, for buprenorphine, uh, for, for treating substance use in pregnancy, just to see, you know, they don't have to take over your patient, but just to make sure that everybody's got the same medication, that we're doing the right thing. Um, next slide real quick. Um, so there's our number there, the support clinic, St. Luke's. That's my email. Postpartum Support International has an excellent, um, even though it says postpartum, it's focused completely on um, all aspects of perinatal mental health. Um, they have a provider consult line. So you as a provider can call that number. If you just go to their website, you can find it. You can call that number, leave a message and a reproductive psychiatrist um, special, specialist will call you back and help you make record and help you kind of work through your patient case and figure out the right medication for patients. Um, you know, there's some other things there. I think um, we always, mother to baby, I hand those forms out a lot to patients when they're like, you know, what's the risk of, of these things? Um, that's some really great patient focused, patient centered language to, to hand out for education stuff. And then the other two slides, I think are just my references. So, um, I think there were some questions. Let me slide yeah. up. Are you able to unmute and ask them, please? Yeah, I um, I'd be happy to. Um, so, I uh, Jerry, you mentioned um, that there are possible consequences to obtaining urine drug screens in pregnant women. Um, are illicit drug findings in urine on a pregnant woman um, a required CPS report in Idaho or Utah, as far as you know? Um, in Idaho. If they are pregnant, it is not. 
Okay. Once they deliver, once they come that's in to have their baby. So if there is substances in the urine at the time of delivery, that's when the, um, the CPS referral has to be made. Okay. Yeah. My practice tends, to, I, I usually try to make them pretty low, you know, try to try to, yeah, I really want to have this urine drug screen just to be a dialogue between us about, you know, mm-hmm. what you're in or what you're on or what might be in the drugs that you have been using and not as a way to get you in trouble or make a paper trail to give to law enforcement. So I usually do urine drug screens, but I don't want to inadvertently get someone in trouble with the law or fail to report. Mm-hmm. I'm in Utah, so I'll look up the regulations mm-hmm. where I am at. And then um, the second question I had, um, so while you were talking, I was looking over PubMed uh, just, and I found, came across this uh, um, abstract saying that buprenorphine naloxone actually has a lower rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome yeah. than bup alone. Um, it's behind a paywall, or I, I haven't looked uh-huh. that hard to, to try to find it, but um, I put the link in the chat. Okay. I just wondered if, you, if you'd heard about that or if anyone had heard about um, buprenorphine having lower um, neonatal abstinence stuff. Um, I am not 100% familiar with it. I can, if you have your email in there, I can send you this, um, the, the link to the article that Dr. Miller, um, like I can send you the article that Dr. Miller has um, I think written. I found it, it too. Is that it? Is it the uh, same? No, I think this is a different one. This is okay. uh, just a little cohort study, but the okay. meta-analysis thing, I think I found too. And that, um, okay. that looked good and indicated that, yep, Lauren Miller, is that correct? Yep. 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 yep found it. Um, yeah, and that looked great and, and seemed that, you know, treatment outcomes were pretty much the same. Uh Um, and that I, this was, this other cohort study was published in 2020. So I, I'm not sure if it was included in that meta-analysis. And so I was just kind of curious if if you've heard of it. I, I have not. No. Are you able to unmute and put in, uh, what you put in the chat or say what you put in the chat, please. Yeah, you bet. So um, I, I have not read the study, but I just pulled it up on PubMed. And in the results, it goes on to say that adjusting for dose of buprenorphine product at delivery um, and some other factors, um, it, the, the results were negated. So basically, the conclusion was that they seem to be equivalent in, in that study in 2020. Okay, cool. Thank you. You bet. All right. Are there other questions? No, I, I actually, I do have a question. Um, I don't see a lot of patients who are on extended release naltrexone for opioid use disorder, but if you did have a patient who was on naltrexone and, and then they became pregnant, you know, how do you handle that? Um, so that's the Vivitrol, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, we actually have had a, um, just one of those incidental cases where the patient comes to us and she has been on it and doesn't realize she's pregnant. She's already 24 weeks pregnant. Um, we have continued it. Like I said, I'm just I don't want to say I'm just a nurse. I don't like to say that, but, um, you know, I don't get to make those prescribing decisions. Um, but I, uh, you know, I think that's one of those decisions where, um, where you just have that dialogue with your patient. You talk about the risk benefit, um, pull up the studies. Um, like I said, some of the early studies are looking promising, um, for, um, for using it in pregnancy, but, um, more to come, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. What other questions do folks have? Yeah, Derek, I appreciate that. I just didn't read all the way because I didn't see that it was negated. So th- thanks for <laughs> reading more carefully than I, I do. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Todd, I'm wondering if I can tee you up and provide your perspective and your thoughts. Oh, Todd, you're muted though. So I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Unmuted. Oh. I thought it was a great presentation. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really doing, I'm not doing prenatal care anymore. Um, so I don't really have a lot to add, but I, I thought it was very comprehensive. It was, it was a presentation from someone that, you know, deals with it almost every day. And I thought it was a great presentation, Jerry. I appreciate you doing it. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, we're lucky we have Dr. Seitz Clinic here. We're lucky we have, um, you know, Raise the Bottom and Centers for Behavioral Health. You know, we, we have these resources in Boise. Um, so we're, we're fortunate. But it's a little more challenging for people in other parts of the state. And uh, um, 
more challenging for their patients who may have to travel. Dr. Runyon, I'm wondering if I can tee you up. Do you have anything to add from that perspective? Um, or even a, with pain in pregnancy and pain management? He may not be on anymore. You know, if, if I, I have one other question. Um, so when we're seeing patients that raise the bottom, you know, who are on methadone, who are pregnant, if they don't have an OB provider and we get them over to see maternal field medicine, um, will you all follow them along if that's really their only kind of complicating factor if otherwise it's a, you know, unremarkable pregnancy? Because yeah, there is you know, a stigma that oftentimes we have a hard time finding an OB provider that right. doesn't kind of want <laughs> yeah. to get them off methadone or give them a hard time. Right. Um, you know, we're happy to follow them in our in our clinic. Um, if they have an OB provider or someone that they want to see somewhere else, we're happy to do consults and just kind of work with that provider. But but yes, we definitely see patients um, whose only issue is that they're on methadone. And even if they've been stable on it for years, um, we're, we're still happy to, to see those patients. Great, thanks. Jerry, if I may ask, to what extent do you involve uh, family in these meetings with the, the patient about their issues, especially, you know, maybe fathers, parents? Yeah, so we um, are, are, you know, whoever the patient brings with them, we're happy to, you know, as long as they want to talk about it in front of them. Um, we're happy to talk with them. We get a lot of patients who say, you know, they bring their partner with them, especially now with COVID, we're only allowing one visitor. They'll bring their partner with them or their friend or whatever, but they'll say they're getting pushback from their their mom or whatever who wants them to stop or, or wean off the medication, which is definitely not, you know, indicated in pregnancy. Um, we will... Um, I, I do a lot of stuff on the phone. I do a lot of education on the phone. We, we do see quite a few patients who are incarcerated. Um, and so I have them fill out their, um, an ROI so I can talk with their family members. Um, and I really feel like the more people you bring in about it and the, the decreases the stigma, we talk about, you know, this is the disease that, that this woman has and we're, we're treating it. And, um, you know, it's no different than any other disease. And these are the medications we use for it. And this is what the standard of practice is. And this is, you know, nationwide, what we have found is the best, the best care. Um, so we definitely are open with talking, talking with people. Like I said, I do a lot of stuff on the phone um, and happy to do it. I just want to say thank you. This is Brenda at Race the Bottom. Um, I just want to say thank you to you guys because you guys are amazing. Um, I know that we have appreciated the years, the several years of work we've been able to, to coordinate care with patients and how supportive you guys are. Um, our patients appreciate it and we, we really appreciate it because unfortunately, like Derek said, we do get some pregnant women that come in that say, oh, I went to my OB and they want me to taper off and we kind of go through all of that and it can be discouraging for them, discouraging for us. So, yeah, yeah I am finding that um, more of the new, the newer OBs, the ones that are, have had some addiction medicine in their training um, are definitely more understanding, more knowledgeable about it. And, and it's a little bit sometimes easier to work with them. Um, you know, that being said, you know, anyone who educates themselves and gets up to speed on, on the current practice can do a great job too. But um <laughs> But yeah, you're welcome, Brenda. We yeah appreciate the partnership with you too. Thank you. Kathy, are you able to unmute and talk about this study? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, just looking at kind of the overview of this study of it was a prospective designed cohort study that um, looked at um, the use of various medication, you know, assisted treatments for pregnancy. And they had, mm, it's 230 patients, 121 patients um, on naltrexone compared to 109 on either methadone or buprenorphine. And they didn't see any differences between the groups um, actually, the rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome in neonates greater than 34 weeks gestation was lower in the naltrexone medication assisted group. But otherwise, there were really no differences. Um, and like this is 
not a huge study by any means, but just use on naltrexone. What other questions do you all have, or pearls, I guess? All right. Amy, do you have any last thoughts or pearls that you want to um, talk about before we uh, no, I just was going to say, I appreciate the presentation today. I think we really need to get more information around this. I mean, if you look at some of the national trends, um, one of the highest trends from the last uh, study for 20, see, they, haven't turned, they haven't released 2021 yet, but for 2020, one of the highest trending populations for um, opiate use was actually women, pregnant women. And so um, I agree, there's still a lot of stimuli, uh, like, you know, people have a lot of judgment and different things around that. And so the more we can spread the word and, and help people to become more comfortable and understanding the issues and the situations and helping people move forward instead of sort of shaming them. I know when we, we deal with a lot of pregnant women that come into treatment, um, for a while we were the designated provider for the state for pregnant women and women with children. And um, you know, there was just like you talked about all the shame and also not wanting to admit to any use for fear of repercussions or things like that. And so I really appreciated the uh, context of the lecture and just think that's, it's, it really is a huge issue and something that, you know, we've got St. Luke's and we've referred to them and worked with them at times and had a great experiences, but we need, we need a lot more people like this to help, um, help folks that are struggling. So I thought it was a great presentation.